Welcome to Wildspire. You get to be a fly on the wall for my intimate conversations with entrepreneurs who are changing the world. I'm your host, Stephanie Benedetto, coach, storyteller, and unmarketer at The Awakened Business, helping coaches and change-making entrepreneurs unleash their inspired message and share it with playful unmarketing. I'll ask curious questions and explore uncharted waters with my guests today. Anything can happen when we step into the unknown of infinite creativity, and that's where we're going to play. I had an absolutely delightful conversation with Lillian Brummett. Her open heart and generous spirit was so apparent and she treats us to a spontaneous poetry reading so there are many gifts in this conversation let me tell you a little bit more about Lillian Brummett Lillian and her husband Dave are the team behind Brummett Media Group high-fiving cheerfully as they pass each other on the way from checking off one item or another from their long to-do list Their business includes Dave's music studio and percussion repair services, Lillian's dog sitting services, numerous award-winning books, a YouTube channel, and two popular blogs. You're about to learn more from Lillian Brummett. Hi, Lillian. Welcome to my Wildspire podcast. I'm so pleased to have you as my guest today. Thank you, Stephanie. It's great to be here. And oh my goodness, what a what a wonderful experience this is going to be for you and me and our listeners. I'm really excited to be here today. Yeah, me too. So great. just as you're listening to give you a little background on Lillian, we met, I think, a couple weeks ago. And one of the things that strikes me the most, even from our first communications before we met, is your positivity and the life that like you're living I want to say like you're living lit up like I feel that from you like a desire to really inspire to be inspired and to inspire that spark in others and man of course I want to share more of that and I want to share the people with you that I meet who are doing that so I'm so glad you're here Lillian Oh, that's really cool that you that you picked up on that and that you communicated with that with me. That really means a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, it's true. It's it's really obvious. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you had mentioned mm-hmm. your desire to live more consciously in the moment and to help others do the same. What does that what does that mean to you? Okay, so for me, I take it back to the breath. So every breath that we take is a moment that just passed. Right now, a moment just passed. And being aware of that moment and the power of a moment. So if I'm sitting across the room from a coworker and they're having a tough day and I can see they're having a tough day and maybe my glance of support or smile or nod at them it's going to change how they're feeling at that meeting. That is the impact of the moment, a glance, a smile, a word, an action. That moment has incredible power. If we become more aware of each moment and the impact that we can have, the greater value our life is going to have. So every moment that passes, we're already having an impact. Our mindset has an impact. Our intent has an impact. So when we're um, when we're unconscious of that moment, we're going about uh, blundering in life. I would say bumping into walls because in that moment we're not being conscious about the kind of impact that we're having. So whether we know it or not, we're having that impact. We can make a conscious choice to make that impact a positive one. And I guess that's where our entire lifestyle, my husband and I, our business, the what we write, what we focus on, all focuses on making that moment the most, you know, using it to have the most valuable impact that we personally can have with that. And then spreading that out to people, you know, showing them that the smallest things that we do can often have the greatest impact on another person. 
It really can. So I want to give a, an example of this. There's one moment that will always stand out to me. Um, I had been away from my family for a couple of years. I was in my childhood. We grew up really rough childhood. You know, my mom married um, five times altogether. Uh, in between her marriages, I was sent away for a couple of years. Um, I came back to the household and I felt like a stranger, you know, like I had childhood memories of her, but, you know, I'd been away a substantial amount of time in my early teen years where it was essential development that she wasn't there for. And so for me, it was almost like I, we were strangers. So we get into this life and she didn't know what to do with me. She didn't have the uh, skills to deal with a kid who had been through what I had been through. And I didn't have the communication skills or and you know, I was a child. I didn't have the ability to even understand what I was feeling, let alone deal with my relationships with my mom. So we had this really difficult relationship. It was like a um, codependent, but also very uh, toxic at times, too. And so that became very, very, very difficult. And so I had been with her maybe a year at this point, she had gone through the women's shelter, women's transition. She had gone into a home. She brought me into that home. So during that time, she was dating men. And these men were not good men. And I was angry about her making these choices. So she was dating men who were drinking or, you know, very unhealthy men. And um, putting me in situations where I was old enough to understand that this was crap. You know, like you don't bring your daughter to this man's house and leave her in the kitchen while you go have a booty call in the bedroom. You just don't do that. Right. And so these kinds of things had real, we were really contentious relationship at this point. And I had left the home and I had gone into an alley near my home and I was bawling my eyes out in desperation, in anger, in fatigue, all of that. And this is about maybe three months before I was on my own. I was 13 years old at this time. And so I'm in the alley and I was just tragically having my moment in privacy, I thought, because it's a dark little alley corner. And this man walks by and I could tell from his body language, from the view on his face, the expression on his face, he was very concerned about me and he really didn't want to leave, but he didn't know what else to do. And he stopped and he said, are you okay? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm fine, you know, brush it off. And off he went. That moment has never left me because at that moment, I, I realized that even a stranger can care. Even a stranger can care. And I was so vulnerable and I felt like no one cared. And for someone who didn't know me from Adam to stop and take a moment and express some care, it had such an impact on me and I'll never forget it. So those moments are hugely powerful. We don't even know the impact that we're having. Wow. Thank you, Lillian. I'm really, I'm really so moved hearing about that experience in so many ways. You know, I, I was feeling through imagining what it might have been like for you to be so scared and distraught and then to have that glimpse of hope that someone cares from a stranger. Yes. A, a casual interaction. Yes. And what's really possible in that. You know, when I think about, I love that, being aware of the moment. There's, you know, sometimes if I think about it a certain way, it can start to feel almost a little heavy, like it's mm -hmm. an obligation. Like if I'm not aware enough, yes, then I'm missing something. And then there's tension around it which yes. actually takes me out of the moment, yes. which actually makes me less aware of it. So like when I come into a conversation like this in particular, mm -hmm. or a conversation when I'm, you know, working with um, a client in coaching, but really any conversation with a person, because it doesn't have to be in a, a, a formal capacity in some way, you know, mm -hmm. I just, to the best of my ability, which is variable, depending on how much noise is in my head, just I'm here, I'm mm. present. And I think that when we do that, when we're not following the noise in our head and thinking about the past, 
worrying over the future. We're right here. That's when those little things that make a big difference occur to us. Mm -hmm. Because like if that man had been walking down that alley wrapped up in his own drama, he wouldn't have even seen you, let alone right. stop to say hello. But because he was present, he was aware. And because of that, when we're in that place, when we're not wrapped up, when, we're, when we don't have a lot on our mind, we're available to the people and things around us. We're available to our environment. And it happens quite naturally. Mm -hmm. So to me, like this, this living more consciously in the moment really comes, it comes for, again for me from, from just being present and listening is a great way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. Breathing, as you mentioned the breath, like just being with your breath dropping out of thought and into this moment. And there's really not a lot that we need to do when we're here. Whatever we need to do occurs to us. And I'm wondering, like, what, when do you notice that you are most, most aware of the moment and most available to that? Um, I think that I'm probably on the other side of it where sometimes I'm a little too aware of the moment, as you were saying, where sometimes I feel the heavy responsibility mm -hmm. of it. Um, and I'm glad that you brought that up because that is very, very true that it can become a weight and it can feel like a responsibility. I've, heard, I've had these conversations with volunteers as well. So mm -hmm. they're out there volunteering. And they think, gosh, you know, maybe I could take on a little more. And then oh, maybe I could take on a little more. And geez, I just don't have enough left in my day and my time to do these other things that I see all this need. And I just, I feel compelled to do it. And I feel responsible and the weight of needing to the need. And yet I can only do what I can do. And that's okay. We don't have to do everything, but we do need to be proactive. We do need to get involved in one way or another. It doesn't have to be volunteering, but I mean, we need to get involved in making the world a better place in our own way from where we are at that moment. Um, whether it's we're out there shopping and we're making a conscious choice about what we're doing, uh, purchasing, whether we're involved with our collaborators in our business and we're saying, you know, how can we align our belief system so that we support each other and elevate this conscious this consciousness, the, the awareness of this particular cause or event that we're working on together. There are things that we can do that can that can um, be very, very powerful and have an incredible reach, but we also have to allow space to just be and not have to take on the weight of the world either. Yeah. So I'm curious, when do you most notice that you're able to do that? to be proactive, mm -hmm. to be involved, to do the things that make a difference without it feeling heavy. Like, can you notice the difference? Yes, I started small. So I started really small. So back in um, 99, uh, 98, my, my focus changed in life. At the time I was looking at, you know, building my business and you know, getting a house and having children and all the shoulds that were on my list, checking them off, you know. And um, and so I got involved into an accident, uh, a three car pileup, and I was in the middle. And basically that took away my business. I, poof, it was gone. And I was in physiotherapy for a couple of years, full time for a year and a half, five days a week. And um, then it petered off for the next uh, half a year or so after that. And then I just had to get uh, uh, help here and there. And during that time frame, losing the business, going through the pain, refocusing my life, trying to figure out what I was going to do now with my new limitations and what have you, um, that was a, I fell into chronic depression. I did. I fell into chronic depression. I didn't really feel like going on, didn't feel like going forward. And so I had to change my life and it started small. I started by eliminating news. I turned off the news, no more news. I unsubscribed from all the magazines, all the newspapers, anything that had any kind of negative information in it. Don't want it. I don't want it in my life. I want to hear about the good things that are happening in the world. And I started feeding myself with that and slowly, slowly crawled out of depression with that 
one action. Just feed myself with positivity. Don't look at all the negative stuff. It's not that I don't want to be informed. I just am choosing what I'm feeding my brain. I'm feeding it positivity as opposed to negativity. And then eventually about six months after doing that particular action, Dave and I were looking at, okay, well, where are we going to take our lives at this point? You know, I had to start a new career. I had to figure out some sort of way of earning money, um, fulfilling my life. And that's where the writing came in. And because I was already on this journey of focusing on positivity and proactive proactive lifestyle, I began my writing life in that way. And that opened when I started writing in that way with freelance writing, article staff writing, assignment writing, those types of jobs I was doing. Then I got involved in doing book reviewing uh, professionally for a couple of different publications. And I chose only to review books that were going to have a positive impact on the reader. And so I was feeding myself with all this positive information and knowledge from all of these wonderful resources. And eventually I got into doing talk radio. I ran a talk radio show for 15 years and it ran live three times a week, an hour each time. And I would have people come on from all around the world and they were talking about what they were doing to make the world a better place. We'd have somebody come in and talk about a volunteer project they were involved in or someone started a business based on reusing materials and turning it into musical instruments. Or we would have someone come in, you know, all of these different types of activities. Um, And so that just fed me and fed me and fed me. And I started seeing not only my own lifestyle grow in that regard personally, all the activities, gardening, growing, you know, how we manage our home, improvements that we did to our home, everything we did was with this focus. But also I felt fed, fed as a human being, like The world is not such a dark place. And look at all these incredible things that are happening around us that we're blind to because traditional media doesn't cover those kinds of things. We're absolutely blind to. We don't see what our neighbor is doing. We don't see what the uh, nonprofit down the block is doing. And when we open up our eyes to these and help celebrate them and spread the word about them, share the information about them. Hey, there's this nonprofit, look at what they're doing. Hey, there's this event that going on downtown. Um, you know, check out this nonprofit. Uh, you know, whatever we can do to align our beliefs and celebrate others as well. So for a business, you might say you have a blog or an in-house newsletter or a e-bulletin that you send out to your clients. Maybe we can then celebrate people that we are aligned with in our business, their activities. Maybe they are involved with a youth group and they're doing some incredible work with them. Maybe it's an author who donates books to a certain cause or a literacy center. Let's highlight the activities that they're doing and bring awareness that these things are happening all around us. The more that we do that, the brighter life is for other people around us as well. Mm. That's really cool. You know, what I hear in in your story, Lillian, is that you noticed that in your depression, understandably, you were staring into this black hole of all the things that you had lost and all of the, I, I don't, I can only imagine what you were experiencing at that time of the loss, the, the, the uncertainty and all of those things and noticed, you noticed it and went, hey, what can I do? to have a different experience. And well, okay, I'm not going to look at the news. I'm not going to look at the negativity. And you just shifted your focus to the direction that you wanted to look in of something positive and beautiful and how people were making a difference. And that alone, you know, and I'm sure it wasn't, at least because these changes in my own life haven't been necessarily, oh, wave the magic wand and everything is, you know, but But there can be a moment where everything changes when you see that something different is possible. And in that moment, it does change. You're looking, you're living in a different world where Uh beautiful things are happening. And I've seen that with with clients who've been depressed, experiencing depression, or have a diagnosis of something like bipolar disorder, that even something as simple as finding a beautiful moment every day 
starts mm. to tune you into something different. You know, um, a good friend of mine who had shared that he had experienced um, depression for some years and could tell you, you know, why and where it came from and, you know, plot out the story in a way that really sounds very credible. He realized one day that he wasn't always depressed all day long. Like he would have told you that he was, but when he looked at it, he saw that there was always at least one moment where he felt contentment and peace. And for him, it was like drinking a cup of coffee in the morning. Like he always right. felt good. And he started to notice, oh, I'm not always feeling depression. There's something else available. And just by shifting his focus to that one moment, all of a sudden it opened up this possibility. And gradually, not all at once, like, you know, he the way he describes it, he still had feelings of depression and still does mm -hmm. occasionally, but his orientation shifted. You know, what he was aligned with in his life, the direction he was looking with shifted dramatically and it changed the whole course of his experience. And I hear that you did that for yourself and also not only did that for yourself, but but made it a mission to help other people begin to do the same and see that there's something else that's possible. Yes, it's so very true. And, it, you know, at first it started out like this desperate uh, lifeline for me. And then it involved like, oh, I'm going to protect myself from the world and I'm just going to focus on these positive things. And then I was able to branch, open up those gates. And as you say, you know, let's bring other people involved. Let's get more things happening. What else can I do to, you know, to play a role and, and celebrate what other people are doing and create conversations and things like that. So it, it was a, a process. It wasn't something that I, you know, and with my personality, I tend to be kind of a, a, a closed person. And so, um, you know, doing this journey also, um, helped me become more open and a little bit more willing to be vulnerable, um, instead of being so protected all the time. Hmm. That's funny that you describe yourself as a closed person. It's not my experience of you at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think that in, you know, how we see ourselves in the inner emotions, mm -hmm. you know, I think on the very inner, inner side, I have this tendency from the past to want to protect myself and to put myself in a cocoon. And here you go. Everything's OK. You know, lullaby myself. And that's my life. But. I have learned that um, through running this business, which has built up my confidence and allowed me to reach out to other people, I realized I can have a greater impact. You know, just telling my story can have a huge impact on someone. Just sharing a quote on my blog might entirely change someone's, you know, outlook on their life or for that moment. And so these little actions, I start realizing, wow, you know, I can, I can have an impact. I can make a difference in the world. And I can also celebrate others who are doing that as well. And by celebrating them, they feel like they're supported. Maybe they're going to continue what they're doing because of that support. So it's this circle and cycle that sort of like it fed me and it helped me not become such a, um, uh, uh, the tendency to be recluse and and cut myself off out of um, a sense of protection, you know. Um, but I was able to break through that in my lifetime gradually into what I'm able to do now. Yeah, it was definitely a gradual process, but I do have those tendencies. When I'm uncomfortable, um, I'll want to shut down. I'll want to close off. Um, if there's really uncomfortable conversations, if there's an argument about to happen, I'm ready to just, you know, I'm ready to shut down. I'll leave. You know, I just, I don't handle certain things well um, inside myself. So I've learned slowly how to allow these things to happen and be okay with these things um, and not have to shut down, not have to run away. That's That's really beautiful to hear. Because it, it to me, it gives a message of hope for anyone who might find themselves with having tendencies or habits that they know aren't serving them or closing them off from the people around them or creating certain experiences they don't like. We're not stuck with it. Mm. You know, it's there really, there really is a way. 
And it's quite, and, yeah. yeah. And you, you know, the world is just not as dark as we perceive it to be. Everything is perception. Yeah. Everything is perception. And if we change our focus and the things that we feed our mind, we start to realize the world is not such a dark place. There are a lot of beautiful things happening out there, wonderful, caring things happening every second all around us. We just have to open ourselves up to it, start feeding ourselves with that. It's incredible the change that happens within yourself when when your perception begins to change. Yeah. Mm. You know, I believe and I have an experience of I don't know what we want to call it. You call it different things. This intelligence in us, this intuition, this spirit source, God, I don't know, whatever it is that whispers to us, that guides us. And, you know, when I'm, when I'm present, I'm most able to hear it. And I really love the idea that, that I can be used by that on not just behalf of myself and my own life, but for other people. That that one little random like, hey, I might be like, hey, wave to somebody who's a stranger on the street, which is so random. Or just have a, a casual interaction with someone could really make a difference to the things that, that I'm inspired to write and share. Mm. That sometimes I feel blessed enough to actually get feedback about. But it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like it's the in the act itself, I just believe that it it makes a difference, even that. Um, and I've found that the more the more relaxed and present I am, the more I'm I'm no longer afraid to open up my eyes and look at the world and what the needs of other people. And you know, not that I'm ever drawn to go into negativity. In fact, I just had a conversation with a, one of my clients last week and she was going into um, an old story and I, I made a joke about it. And it's, it's not uncommon for me to do that. And she said, you know, I felt a little bit dismissed at first, you know, because mostly in like therapy and stuff are taught to like validate the feelings and be like, oh, that must be so hard for you. And it's not that I wasn't feeling that. And this was actually from her. She said, you know, I felt like I was dismissed, but in a way that was really good for me. In other words, mm. like, you don't like, isn't that funny? Like, you don't have to do that. Like, see how funny it is that you're telling that story and torturing yourself. How about this? Let's yes. shift in the direction of like humor, see it as funny. And it sort of transitions. And, and I sat with that and I was like, am I okay with, with having a client who felt like she was dismissed? And I was like, well, yeah, because honestly, I, I'm often making light of things mm -hmm. and not in a way that is ever meant to dismiss or not listen to someone. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if I ever misstepped with that, I would apologize and listen because it's never my intention. But when I'm present, I can play with that a little bit. And that's something of what how the universe sometimes moves through me. It's just like making fun of things because you better believe I am making fun of myself. And as soon as I can see my own behavior is funny, I know I am not stuck in it anymore. Uh. And so it was just a nice, um, a nice reminder that, well, I don't think we have to take ourselves so seriously. We're a lot, we have a lot more fun when we don't. Right. Right. And it's all about those stories that we tell ourselves too, mm -hmm. isn't it? Right. Actually, I wrote a story about a poem about that. I don't know if you want me to read it during the interview, but it's called Virago. And it takes, it's it, the, the term Virago is a female warrior. Mm -hmm. Warrior is male, female warrior is Virago. And it basically talks about. Yeah. Why don't um, you, why don't you read it? Your interpretations. Okay. Yeah, go for it since it came up. Okay. I'd love to hear it. And then maybe I'm, we can really talk like about it after. One. Yeah. Okay. And it's so much along what we're talking about today. Okay. So Virago, gone are the days of head down, eyes averted. Gone are the days of silence. So many years of stumbling over such trifle, insignificant things. Fumbling, though I learn, even solid matter is not what it seems. Everything is an enigma. I learned that interpretations are based on stories that I tell myself according to the narrow window view that I have had at the time. 
these wild, amazing, painful experiences reflected in my own mirror, a mirror full of stories. Shamans tell us the true warrior is not a mindless, obedient soldier, loving the team, thrilling in the rush, hating the haunting horror. This budding virago learned that a true warrior strives for personal freedom to unlock the barriers we set for ourselves to change society by involving into a virago. Viragos are aware of the fertile, uh, sorry, fertile soil of the mind, of the seeds that we allowed to plant and those we plant ourselves. Viragos consciously choose the seeds they will nurture. A warrior starts with this awareness, just growing consciousness of everyday experiences and interactions. They learn the power of a single word and they fear to abuse it. The spoken words, the words in thought, they strive to be impeccable with word. Viragos learn not to take life experiences too seriously or too personally. They learn that her reaction or his facial expression or memories recounted to ourselves do not define us. They have nothing to do with us. The walking wounded, however, they tell themselves awful stories. We agree to plant that seed and oh, we nurture it. It becomes part of our belief system. A virago learns to ask questions, to research, to become educated instead of assuming or telling stories. Virago warriors learn that forgiveness begins with themselves. They learn to live simply. They accept that doing their best is enough. Their intent was pure. The impact meant to be positive. They put forth their best effort, knowing that the quality of their best will vary day to day, hour to hour. But they were authentically themselves, and that is enough, no matter how flawed they tell themselves they are. Viragos embrace the belief that each moment is a valuable gift. They live fully in the moment. They don't let go of the past, but they become okay with it. They become a giant in the war against the inner judge, the victim, the belief system that they built every single day of their life based on agreements that they made. Yeah, you're right. I'm slow. Yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm weird. Yeah, that's God. That's not. Agreements that became a belief system. This is the war that true warriors and viragos, if you're a girl, joyfully and enthusiastically face, challenging the loud inner voices of those parasite entities, the judge, the victim, the belief system. Mm. So. Wow, Lillian, thank you. You're welcome. Very much along the lines of what we're speaking about today, right? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I feel I feel the power of that. Like the simple the simple power of knowing yourself as the creator of your inner reality, mm. which creates the world you see outside. Yes. It's everything. Yes. And it starts when we're so young, like initially, you know, we're just sponges when we're so young. Right. And we don't realize that even as a child, we are accepting those belief systems that, you know, those seeds, we're planting those seeds, we're nurturing them and they become our belief system. So we see a glance from across the classroom and we might think that glass glance means we've been criticized or judged in some way. And in our own mind, our inner voices, our saboteurs are just working like crazy and they're really nurturing that seed and it's planted and that's going to grow into a massive forest if we allow it to. So sometimes it's a matter of, you know, going in there and do some clear cutting and replanting with some positive seeds. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Mm. I'm hoping you'll share that with me after this. Sure. So that maybe yes. I can even put that in the blog post if you want or link to sure. it if you prefer. Yeah, Because sure. it's really beautiful. I'd like to come back to it. Okay. No, it seems to me, and I had a conversation on another podcast episode, um, with a, a gentleman who's actually from a Muslim background called mm -hmm. um, Mudassir. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And he talked about the seeds in our mind, the seeds that we nurture with our attention Mm -hmm. and how where we put our attention is where, you know, it determines what seeds will grow. And simply by noticing that, you can have a huge shift in your experience and your whole life will change just yes. by realizing that we have this beautiful power of awareness and then this gift of attention that we can put it somewhere else. And we don't know that. Like, it's not like, like you or I, when we were, when we were young and, and had taken on these belief systems or, you know, these these habitual thoughts from our parents or other authority figures or people in society, Mm -hmm. we didn't do it on, we didn't know that we were nurturing them by giving them our attention. Like it, it just seemed like that's the way it is. We didn't even know there was something else available, but as soon as we see that there is, which is what I hear you really offering, like there is a different way, like it's, (laughs) and it's right here. Yes. As soon as we know there's a different way, really, we'll take it. Mm. We will take it. That's why Absolutely. what you're doing is so powerful and such a gift. Oh, thank you. You know, one thing that I struggle with often, and I know a lot of people do, is, you know, that midnight voice that comes up and tells us, you know, we're not good enough, or the mistake that we made 25 years ago is still cycling around in our head and we're still beating ourselves up about it. And one thing that I've been on, um, a journey of in regards to not dismissing those thoughts necessarily, but uh, diffusing them is to say to myself, what was my intent in that moment? So yeah, I made a mistake. Maybe I hurt someone's feelings or maybe I could have reacted in a better way, or maybe I could have been there on that moment for that person. But what was my intent? Was I intending to hurt them? Was I intending to create harm? You have to like step back and see what was your intention? You know, maybe because we weren't so aware of the moment or because of our exhaustion in the moment, we weren't at our best. That doesn't mean that we're flawed as a human being and we can start to forgive ourselves, which um, is something that I I really struggle with. And I, I'm sure a lot of people do, but, you know, especially in those sleepless nights when this mind starts wanting to cycle through thoughts, it wants to bring up all this stuff. It tells you, Oh, remember this? <laughs> Let's take a good look at how, you know, poor you were on this day. And it wants to remind you. So I try to, I try to diffuse that by telling myself, well, let's take a look at that. What was my intent and try to, uh, try to be a little bit more aware of that too, you know, learning, making mistakes is part of learning and growing and evolving as a person. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're flawed. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing to remember. I like reminding myself about the natural innocence of what we are as little children, as babies coming into the world. You know, I don't think that that ever changes, but what you said so beautifully in that piece you read is that when we're under the influence of those dark stories, the world looks dark. And I don't remember how you said it, but I felt it in there Uh that, oh, the, the victims and the, you know, those, those, when we're in that place, that's how the world looks and we act from it. Uh And it's an innocent to the best of our ability, doing what we know to do. And sometimes it can be pretty harmful to ourselves and others. Mm. But to remember that for myself and for others helps bring compassion and forgiveness. Because I don't think we, if we really knew what we were doing, we wouldn't have done it. If we really saw how we were hurting, we wouldn't have gone there. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And, you know, forgiveness for things that happened to us, that was something I always struggled with when I, you know, was being told from counselors or from others who would say, you know, you know, in order to get over your abuse or whatever, your victim story that you have, you need to forgive. So that word I had such a hard time with um, because it just didn't seem like the appropriate response to what I went through. And later on, I learned that it wasn't forgiving them and it wasn't forgiving myself. 
and I don't even know if forgiving is exactly the right word. I think letting go is probably a better term for it. You're basically acknowledging what is and what was. And the only responsibility that we have is what we're going to do with that experience and our feelings now. So our actions, we are proactive, conscious action now. That's the only thing that matters. So what happened to us before, it happened. Might have sucked, but it happened. And just accept that it happened. It doesn't mean you forgive it. But it, for me, it just helped me like let it go more than the term forgive when mm. it came to like say harm that was done in the you know childhood or something like that, or those victim stories that we sometimes repeat to ourselves. Oh, look at what happened to me and how it affected me. We can say yes, that affected me, and I've grown and I've evolved from there, and I choose now to do this. So I think it puts it in a different different set of of mind that forgiveness mm. sometimes that can be a, a totally I don't know that's a totally different thing forgiveness of myself I think came from just understanding that as we were saying you know there are times when we stumble and we fall and we walk into the wall and we blunder and we you know that's part of just living and growing and evolving and that's okay and to accept that just accept that um yeah, acceptance. Mm. Yeah. When you have that acceptance of what is, when you're being with what is, you're free to create something new. Right. Yeah. I'm so Absolutely. glad. So glad you found that. Me too. <laughs> and I'm learning it every day. Mm -hmm. Just last night I was speaking, I was in a writer's group that I run on Mondays night for Monday nights for local writers. And I was speaking one of my challenges, which right now I'm like in, um, in a pause. So I had, you know, done all this work to get a certain project happening. And it was like several months of really intensive work, uh, producing this and, and creating this and getting things published or printed or ready for events, in-person events, all this stuff that is going to happen once this activity gets put in place. And so I'd done, Dave and I had done all of this incredible, heavy, extra work in our schedule. And then, you know, we, we release it, we put it in their hands, and now we're waiting for the launch we were waiting for them to get what they need done so that we can la actually launch the project so for me it's been almost two weeks of waiting and so that's been really really hard for me so speaking about what is accepting what is i was given that advice actually last night in the the um writers group where we were talking about some of the you know inside emotions that we go through as writers and some of the stresses and this is a current stress of mine um, because I'm, I'm a doer and I don't like sort of letting up control. I don't mind, you know, having to have patience as long as I'm, you know, making headway and I know we're moving forward, but when it's in someone's hands and I'm not part of it, that's where it's really, really hard for me because I have to sit back and wait for them and I'm, I'm not in control. And so I, for me, it's really difficult. And so 12 days of just getting stressed and stressed and stressed. And, stressed. and so last night, one of the attendees said to me, you know, I think what we need to do is just learn as writers to just accept that it what is. It is what it is. I did everything I could to this point. Now I'm in waiting. It is what it is. And move move away from the, oh, when am I going to get that text? When am I going to get that message? When is this going to happen? But just getting into the mind frame, it is what it is and just wait. So it really helped me, actually. I even slept better a little bit last night being reminded to accept what is instead of becoming stressed about something that I have no control over. And it's nothing against them. They're doing what they're doing. I have nothing to complain about on their end. It's just my own inner turmoil, my own inner reaction to the situation. So it really helped me to remind myself to be reminded by that. Hmm. So cool because I hear in that exactly what you were talking about. There's this fellow writer who ha makes this, this comment and we need to accept what is. And you heard something in it that shifted mm. something for you and gave you a better night's sleep. It did. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's that yeah. simple, like the difference we can be for each other. And that person right. might not even have known how powerful that was for you, how much you needed to hear that. 
That's really right. cool. Yeah, yeah, it really was. Yeah. Hmm. Well, thank you, Lillian, so much for sharing your story and what yeah. inspires you. Um, if people are listening and they are intrigued, listening or watching, where is the best place for them to find out more about you and what you're up to? Well, um, the very best thing they can do is just go into any search engine of choice, pipe, pipe, uh, type in the words Lillian and Dave Brummett, B-R-U-M-M-E-T, and all kinds of links and pages and pages of links will show up where they can find us on social networking sites. They should be able to find our social media, our blogs, our YouTube channel from there as well. Um, our main website is brummettmedia.ca, but of course they can find us again on YouTube and most social media or social networking sites as well. Um, if they've dropped by Amazon, of course, which I hope they do, they can look in the book section of Amazon, type in Brummett, and they will see our books listed there as well. We have we currently have six available there, and we have a trilogy coming out and then a couple more books in the works behind that as well. So uh, lots more to come in the future. Yeah. Do you want to give just a little bit around the books? Because I thought they were so sure. cool, like just the topics of them, and I'll make sure I leave links on the blog post and description on YouTube. Okay. That would be great. Okay, well, there's there's six of them. So the most recent one is the cookbook, which is called From One Small Garden, Over 300 Delicious Nutritious Recipes, which is what it has. Um, and it's very, very much along the um, informational, uh, educational, ecological uh, mindset of your kitchen. So how can you utilize your kitchen and run it more efficiently, saving water, saving energy, uh, reducing food waste. We also look at packaging um, as well. So we teach you how to make your own chicken coating, your own taco seasoning, your own air fresheners, things that you have in a well-stocked kitchen that you can now make for yourself and you no longer have all these bottles and disposable envelopes and toss away everything. So it helps you along that way as well. Um, the, the next book that I want to mention is the purple snowflake marketing book. And that really is a step-by-step -step guide for writers in, um, understanding the business of being a writer, running their office, developing their business plans, their marketing plans, action plans, succession plans, all those kinds of things. And also helping them develop a marketing plan that's going to last for the life of each book that they write. So a book can have a very long life. It can evolve. So you might have it come out in different formats. You might release it in different ways, a subscription book, or you might create a course around it, or you might start doing speaking events around it. You might end up turning around and uh, releasing new editions. You might work with a different publisher later on when, in, when that current contract runs out. So your book can have a very long life, not just what you current, your current contract with your current publisher has. And so we want you to have a marketing plan that's going to last for the life of that book. And it helps you, uh, it's a guide that'll help you develop it for your unique situation using frugal uh, marketing techniques. And then we have um, the, the poetry series. Uh, right now, it's a two-book series. There should be another one coming out in a couple of years to add to this series. Uh, so right now, it's a, a two-book box set series. It's called Playing in the Sandbox of Words. I really liked that term for, you know, collectively putting all of our poetry books under that uh, umbrella name, because... To me, that's exactly what poetry is. It's just getting in that sandbox and letting go of all the shoulds, all the all the um, barriers to creativity, and just painting with words, getting creative, you know, playing with rhythms and that. So, um, right now, there's rhythm and rhyme. It's a book that Dave and I wrote together of poetry, and then towards understanding. Towards understanding is kind of a chronological story of my childhood up through my early 20s, what it feels like to be a child of abuse and neglect and um, to be abandoned at a young age and being on your own and growing up into your early 20s. So that was my sort of chronological journey um, in that regard. So those are the first two books in that series. Then there's the Trash Talk series, which is the first books that we ever wrote based on a column that I was producing at the time. 
it's now evolved into a two book series. And so book one of Trash Talk, It's Easy to Be Green, it's basically walking people through not just the reuse and repurpose of common items that they would find in their workplace or their home waste baskets, but it also explains the recycling industry and it considers a whole bunch of R's around that. You know, can we reconsider? Can we repurpose um, rent? Can we barter? Can we, there's all these different things. And then with the waste itself, showing you the, how you can support your own community with your waste, your so-called waste. And it's just incredible what we can do for our own community, our own budget, um, and for the environment as well, just by looking at our own waste production and managing it more um, responsibility. Book two goes a lot deeper into it, a little bit roll up your sleeves and get a little bit more involved. So it's more about like saving energy around your home and office, water conservation, um, composting, being proactive in the community, discusses things like eco-vacations, ecotourism, lots of different things that are involved in there, uh, gardening, energy, water. Um, so it's just a little bit uh, more involved in that in the second book as well. So those are the six books that we currently have. Beautiful. Um, we, we have a couple of blogs, Bremet's Conscious blog and the Dremit with Bremet blog. And we also have the Bremet Media um, YouTube channel as well that we manage on top of that. Nice. So lots of places for people to learn more and uh, yes. enjoy your content in these different venues. Awesome. Well, thank you so very thank much, you. Lillian. It's been a great pleasure chatting with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on your show. And I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me for today's Wildspire conversation. If you'd like to receive a weekly Wildspire email from me filled with inspiring stories, unmarketing experiments, tips for playing your way to impact and income without the hustle and hype, insights from my spiritual business journey, and more, go to theawakenedbusiness.com forward slash wildspire. Until next time, may you know yourself as the gorgeous wild creation you are.